Hel Hello everybody uh, and welcome to the inaugural Master Chess web show and uh, it, it features myself Nigel Davis you see the the name has been subtly put underneath me and this is Andrew Martin his name is also there and even correctly spelt and we'll be uh, showing you some bits of chess we're, we're doing this largely for fun at the moment but there again, if we do get like 10% of Nakamura's viewers, we'll be very, very happy. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to I'm going to kick off with a question that I've been uh, asked fairly recently. How does Black win in the Exchange French? Because the the, the French defence tends to be a very popular defence. Except, does this uh, fear that White is going to exchange pawns in the centre? Now, I want to make a disclaimer at this point that whenever uh, somebody writes a book about the French defence, they always say how not drawish the exchange variation is. Right? It's not really true. The exchange French is annoying. There's no doubt about it. However, I do believe that we can uh, find a way around this. And, and if you play logical moves and look for a little bit of unbalance there's a good chance you'll be able to outplay weaker opponents now that doesn't mean you're going to be able to outplay Karyakin right if you play the French against Karyakin and he wants to draw with you then you might have trouble avoiding that so uh, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to show you uh, a couple of games here and This will guide you through what I what I think you can do about the exchange French. So here we go. 1e4, e6, d4, d5. There we have the French defence. And one of the things I like about this opening is that there's a limited number of pawn structures. Usually White either takes or advances uh, or he maintains the tension in the centre with knight c3. But generally speaking, sometime uh, or other, he's going to have to either uh, advance this pawn or capture on d5, or you know he, he'll have to release the tension in the centre. So the exchange variation, the dreaded exchange variation, is with e takes d5. Now we don't want to take with a queen because that can be hit by knight c3. So we take back with a pawn. And now White, if he's looking for a draw, made an inaccuracy. Bishop d3 is not the most accurate move if you want to halve out. And the most accurate move is actually c3. Because that avoids or, or makes Black's attempts to complicate somewhat worse. So now if you go c5, then it's worse than if the bishop's on d3. Because the bishop doesn't want to be on d3 if you go c5. And if black goes knight, uh, knight c6 after this move, then white can do this annoying line. Bishop d3, bishop here, queen f3. And uh, although queen f3 looks really strange, we've all been told not to bring our queen out too early. It is a truly annoying line. Now, the first game we're going to have a quick look at is with bishop d3 and now c5. And this is a very good attempt to unbalance the position after bishop d3. You get an isolated pawn with black, but the good news is that the bishop on d3 is not that well placed. And with an isolated pawn, you get the usual compensating advantages like free play for your pieces, some attacking chances, etc., etc. So the game I'm going to show you is quite a famous one. Uh, Stefano Tatai, uh, who was a former Hungarian and then Italian international master, he escaped from Hungary when it got taken over by the Soviet Union went to live in Italy, very sensible too. And he decided to play the exchange variation against Korchnoi, probably hoping for uh, a half point. Right, now we'll, we'll see how well that goes. 
knight f3, knight c6, queen e2 check. White is trying to displace black's pieces before taking on c5. But on the other hand, this queen on e2 is not optimally placed, as we shall see. D takes c5, knight f6, h3, castles, and white also castles, and black takes on c5. So now you can see that black's got free play for his pieces. Uh, it's still quite surprising that this game is over in less than 10 moves, but uh, I'll show you what happened. c3, rook e8, attacking the queen. The queen needs to go away, goes to c2. And now Korchnoi plays the very uh, dangerous move, queen d6. And this is a, a typical sort of thing you might do in a, an IQP position. But what happens next might have really taken Tatai aback. Uh, white goes knight bd2. And now Korchnoi played this move, queen g3. Uh, for those of you who are wondering, the queen cannot be taken because this pawn on f2 is pinned by the bishop on c5. Meanwhile, black has got a very nasty threat, which is to go bishop takes h3 because the g2 pawn is pinned. Now, this move will nonetheless have taken quite a bit of calculation because I'm sure Korchnoi would have wanted to know that this bishop on c5 cannot be decoyed in some way. Well, okay, uh, Tatai probably after deep thought, uh, he decided to play bishop f5 here and this shields the pawn on h3. So black can't play bishop takes h3 anymore. But what happened now was that black played rook e2 to build up more pressure against f2 well okay white went knight d4 threatening to take the queen but of course black can play knight takes d4 white went c takes d4 and black played bishop takes d4 now according to one version of this game that I, I saw, Tatai actually resigned after knight takes d4. According to another one, it, it continued for 19 moves. So we'll go for the 19 move version because this at least will give you a good idea about how the game <coughs> would end had white continued. So now white plays bishop takes c8 and black goes rook takes f2. Threatening rook takes d2 well, threatening queen takes g2 mate and threatening everything, basically. Rook takes f2 is forced. Queen takes f2 check. The king has to go to h2. If you go to h1, then it's mate immediately with queen g1. He goes to h2. Black gives this check. White goes king h1. And black goes queen e1 check. And it'll be mate next move. So there's the 19 move version of uh, Tatai against Korchnoi. Now, in our main game, we have, it, this was played in the Pro League, so it's an internet game, which I, generally speaking, tend to ignore, but uh, we'll, we'll have a look at it anyway. So this, this game in the Pro League features Bishop D3, and it was between uh, Skuhala and Georg Meyer. Now, I, I, I have to quietly admit to being a big Georg Meyer fan. Why right? he, he suddenly decided to change his federation to Uruguay, and there was a one there was a line that annoyed him in the Rubinstein French, which he played. So what he did is he published loads of analysis showing he would draw, and by doing that, thought that it will probably stop White. Uh, playing against him because it'll just be a draw. So uh, I'm quite a, a Maya fan because of, of because of those things. Switching to Uruguay from Germany, that's uh, that's quite a shock. Has uh, ancestry from Uruguay. Anyway, White now played c3, 
and we get the super annoying queen f3 line here. Well, what happens? Georg Meyer decides to continue as if nothing has happened, and he goes for the line which is supposed to be very, very drawish. This is with bishop g4, and now white plays queen takes g4, knight takes g4, but black, of course, is losing his queen here. Bishop takes d8, knight <coughs> takes d8. Now, probably a lot of games at this point would just end in a draw. But uh, there's quite a big rating difference between these players. Uh, I think uh, Skuhala is uh, rated uh, slightly below 2100. So Meyer obviously wants to win. And he just plays simple chess. h3, knight f6, knight d2, knight e6, knight e2, castles. Now White plays a slightly funny looking move here. He goes g3. I don't know if this was to prevent knight f4. But knight f4 would just simplify anyway. So I think white could have castled here with a clear conscience. So he goes g3. Looks odd to me. White And black goes rook a to e8. Now white goes f4. And that move looks very odd. So I think that uh, Maya was probably already rubbing his hands with glee at this point. Because white is obviously losing the thread. Black plays g6, white goes king f2, and black simply starts the process of doubling rooks on the only open file, that's the e file. White goes rook h e1, and now this is where black opens a second front. This is with the move c5, putting pressure on this pawn on d4, white goes king f3, Again, a very funny looking move. And black just goes rook f e8. So now there's actually a threat to go cd, cd, knight takes d4. Because the, the rook on e1 would hang. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. Say white plays some move like a3. Black just goes cd, cd, kapow. Knight takes d4, rook takes e1. And black wins. So this is why... White decided to play bishop b5, and black just goes rook c8. So the c file may also become open. And it, it's interesting that after just a few slightly casual moves by White, his position is in dire straits. And also interesting was the fact that Meyer, he, he didn't try and complicate, he didn't try and do anything uh, artificial, he just played the most simple natural moves. And that is all the more surprising from someone who switches from Germany to Uruguay. D takes c5, <coughs> bishop takes c5, knight b3, now black goes knight e4, and again, this is such a natural move. The knight moves away from protecting e4, so black goes in there. Knight takes c5, knight 6 takes c5, rook a d1, a6, attacking the bishop. Bishop d3, rook c e8, coming back to the e file. Again, simple chess. White goes bishop c2, and now uh, I would I would ask what should black do here, except that it's right up there in the uh, uh, on the screen. So he plays knight takes g3, and now white is losing because uh, if he goes knight takes g3, rook takes e1 happens. So I'll put in another little note there. So this is why he went king takes g3, rook takes e2, not only going a pawn up, but black has got such a dominating position now because his rook's on the seventh. White exchanges rooks and he takes this pawn. Well, black goes, takes this one, takes here, takes b2. And for a GM of uh, Meyer's credentials, the rest is a, a matter of technique. So now white is driven into passivity. Next thing will be for black to centralise his king. This is all technique. 
king f5 to attack the pawn on f4. Doesn't even take it because of rook f1 check. So uh, goes king up here, king in here, and at this point white resigned. So I will now hand you over to Andrew, who has some very interesting stuff on the England gambit, of all things. In these shows, uh, we're going to try and make it entertaining. And um, the first thing I wanted to do was to uh, look at uh, one of these gambits that is being recommended all over the Internet. You get this sort of thing these days. You know, In order to get the next million followers, they recommend some completely unsound gambit in order to make chess fun for the uh, for the general population. Uh, I'll deal with the Stafford Gambit in, in future weeks. For today, we want to train our guns on the England Gambit, which is, um, as you probably know, D4, E5. And uh, this is actually quite interesting if you're playing Blitz or something like that. But in a real game, it's basically to be avoided. Now, I know that Nigel's got his own opinions on this Gambit, which unfortunately I can't hear. I would like to hear, but perhaps if he's not um, proficient in sign language, he won't be able to tell me what they are. So I'm going to have to wade through this uh, wade through this analysis I've got here, but I hope it will be intelligible to you. Now, the England Gambit um, is essentially a, a line which White has to take the pawn. And then we get a, a situation where Black has to play this very weird move, Queen to E7. Now, there is a different line here called, uh, called I think, the Zilbermintz, Zilbermintz variation, where white play, black plays knight g e7. And again, this is one of those tricky lines that um, could catch a lot of players out if they don't know exactly what to do. There is a similar line in the Albin counter gambit where black plays in a similar manner, but there the position is much more open because black's already played d5. This time around, black just looks to get his pawn back with easy moves like knight g6. But I, I think I've actually found a really good continuation against this, and that's bishop g5. And I don't quite see how, how black is going to uh, meet this move. I mean, f6 looks look nonsensical. And if he puts the bishop in the way, the idea is to just take the bishop and put the knight in on d5. And when... Black moves his queen back, as he has to, to protect c7. You just play queen d2. And then he takes, takes, takes. And then the key move, queen to c3. And and this is uh, this is a rather nice way to play. Because uh, White's attacking the pawn on c7. He's also attacking the knight. Now, I don't think there's anything too difficult in that sequence. In fact, it all comes rather logically. So it's possible that knight g7, whilst... Um, whilst quite imaginative, will have to be consigned to the Gambit dustbin. Uh, maybe not. Maybe somebody will uh, spend hours burning the midnight oil to revive it. But uh, we'll have to see. Anyway, Queen E7. This is the one that's causing the setting the internet on fire. And uh, I'm sure that White can play Knight C3 here. This is a perfectly good move. Uh, just to stick the Knight in on D5. And if he takes, you can go E4. And this is a this is a better position for white, but how much better, we don't know. I mean, I, I prefer to continue with the main line and let black uh, strut his stuff, which is basically check, block, takes. And now the graveyards are full of poor players who played bishop to c3 here. And then bishop b4, we'll just see it once and once only. And it's good night, Charlie. Yes. This has happened many times. So if we go back, we will see knight c3. And now a lot of tricky blitz players play knight b4 here. Again, this is a completely unsound move. But if you've got hardly any time on the clock, then it's, it's actually not that easy to beat. But I think white can meet it successfully with knight to d4. Strange looking move, but it defends against the threat. And... Black's queen is now in jeopardy because white's threatening a move like rook b1 followed by knight b5. And whatever black plays here, he gets into a, a hell of a mess. Um, something along these lines. Once again, black is in dire straits. 
So we're gradually coming towards this main line. And now we've got this sacrifice, which a lot of players have been recommending. Queen takes C3. Uh, personally, I don't think much of it. I'm going to show you why. But once again, in the field of internet blitz, it's, uh, it's obviously tricky to beat. All right, so this is the critical position. Now, I'm going to demonstrate that basically both the captures on E5 are not very good. I mean, I think I think Black is forced to fall back on this move and, and pray that he gets some compensation here for the Queen. But I, I simply don't believe it. I, I mean, if you run this through the engines, you'll find that uh, White is plus two and a half or something like that. Uh, Black has got, what, two minor pieces and a pawn for the Queen. No way it can be enough if you play sensibly with White. So that leaves us with knight takes e5. And now I think rook b3 is an excellent move because it forces the bishop away to an inferior square. I mean, black's got to kick the pin on here. And now this move, rook b5. A little shuffle with white and black is already in desperate trouble. Well, what does he play? If he goes knight c6, we go takes, which is the key move, and now this beautiful move, queen a1. This is a splendid move and really consigns black to the dustbin once again. Because if black plays knight f6, we go queen e5 check, picking up the knight. And if he goes f6, queen to c3, it's all forcing. That's what I like about this line. Queen comes across to g3. And once again, Black is losing his marbles. Which, if we go back, and I hope you're following this, well, of course, if this show's recorded, so you can you can see the analysis later on. If Black plays knight c4 here, takes, takes, queen a1. Again, what can Black play? Knight f6, queen e5 check. Thank you. King f8, queen e5. Knight c6, and then white moves in. And and as far as I can see, this analysis renders this queen sacrifice unworkable. I might be completely wrong. Somebody might correct me. But um, I thought that's interesting. I mean, there are a lot of a lot of interesting moves in that, that sequence of play. You know, uh, obviously, it's a great idea to sack the queen like this. But to be honest with you, if white plays correctly... And I really like this idea of the, the rook moving twice, followed by queen a1. I think this is great stuff. And, uh, of course, it takes it takes a bit of time to, to find that sort of sequence. So let's go back. Uh, hopefully you're following this to the position after rook b1. And imagine that black doesn't want to sacrifice his queen. So this takes us back into the old days of the England gambit. The England gambit was a... Um, I don't know whether it was invented by, but it was certainly by it was certainly uh, uh, populated by Henri Grob, uh, the Swiss master who liked to play G4, and uh, he published a pamphlet on the England Gambit. Um, well, his analysis was very interesting. I do have a copy of this pamphlet, and of course, Queen A3 was the main line for him. But I wonder what he had against knight d5. This is a, a problematic move, I think. Um, Black's got some issues with the c7 pawn. And uh, I'm not actually sure what Black can do in this position. There was a game, Tsonka versus Vofk. Of course, it's played on chess.com. So you, you, can, uh, you can bet your bottom dollar it was a blitz game where Black took on d2. But now it just seems so simple for, for White to get the advantage because Black's got to defend his pawn with a king. And once he does so, we get this moves queen g5 check. And then ruination. Ruination sets in very quickly. So what happened in this game? Well, it was quite entertaining. Black got murdered in a few more moves. Lovely check. 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 And thank you. Checkmate. So if we drop back, 
to knight d5. Let's give black the move. Bishop a5. Um, rook b5. And the pressure, once again, is really on black. Because c7 is just creaking. If he takes on d2, takes with the queen, king d8. Well, I think we can go e4 here. That looks good. Or we could go knight g5. Also looks interesting. Um, let's follow e4 for a little while. And if a6 drops back, queen takes a2. We just continue developing our pieces. And uh, there are even ways to get the advantage tactically. Strange, strange positions come out of the England gambit. Um, now, I know I can't hear Nigel speak, but uh, I wonder if he's got any comments to make on this uh, analysis. Perhaps he'd like to um, say a few words. Anything to say on this uh, fabulous analysis? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would I would struggle to remember it. <laughs> it's all, the piece is flashing all over the place. I, 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 I would really... I didn't realise I'd need a degree in lip reading to do this show. But, uh, yeah, well, that was my little slot on the England Gambit. <laughs> so uh, we can oh, well, safely I, I, move I on to I can hear Andrew on my chapter, phone, Nigel although we, we can't communicate as we should. Then uh, I, can, I can see what you're saying by watching the show. Hopefully, we'll have this sorted by Monday morning. Carry on, sir. <laughs> well, so I'll... Uh... Okay, I'm, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my take now on the England Gambit, which is um, uh, very different. I mean, it, I think it, it shows a different in, a, a difference in approach between myself and, and Andrew on this, this matter. Right, this is a game between uh, Vasquez Schroeder and uh, Monroy Carrizo. And it was played in, it was played in 1970, 2000. It's played in 2000. So it's quite an old game. But it, it, I think it shows a very simple way of uh, making the, the Anglo Gambit extremely unpalatable for black. Right, and so we've got d4, e5, d takes e5, knight c6, knight f3, queen e7, e4, knight takes e5, knight c3. Just simple development, but with the queen on e7. Now, the, the reason why I like this so we much... We had to present this show after 9pm in this time because the of the of content. Defense, the content like is this. not suitable for children. Here, takes, knight takes, knight f3. There is no way black would play queen e7 in this position. Why? Right. He just wouldn't do that. They, they play queen f6. But queen e7 is our England position. It, it happens right here. So if I highlight that move, the pieces do not move, which means we have a transposition. So now after knight c3, I know that people have played c6, but when you have this position with black, you now have a semi-backward d-pawn. So the, the d-pawn can't go to d5. Well, not if we play bishop e2, it can't. And... If it goes to d6, it's potentially a target on this square. And this game continued as follows. Went d6 here. Castles, knight f6. And now rook e1. Just simple chess. g6, b3. And the idea of this move is to put the bishop on a3, where it bears down on this weak pawn on d6. So... 
uh, black went bishop e6, white went bishop a3, knight takes f3 check, because he, white's also threatening knight takes e5 now, because the d-pawn is pinned. So black perhaps thought he could buy his way out of trouble like this. Now there's a threat of e5, and so black castle queenside. When he did this, white went in knight d5, and black, well, if he, you know, he, he's really stuck here. I mean, he took with a pawn, and then white recaptured with his pawn, and black's going to lose his piece back here. Knight takes d5, bishop takes d5. King is exposed, weak pawn on d6. It, it's just clearly better for white. Bishop g7, rook c1. Bishop c3, rook e3. Queen f6, queen d3. Bishop d4, bishop takes e6, check. f takes e6, rook f3. So now black has got this problem. He's got to keep defending this uh, this bishop. Well, white just goes queen c4 check. Oh, and look, the e6 pawn can fall whenever white wants. Well, he goes king d7 to protect it. If he goes king b8, white can just snaffle the pawn on e6. So king d7, heading right for the centre of the board. Rook d1. Bishop e5, rook f d3. And now black went king e7, and white played f4. So black's position is just collapsing at this point. Black played b5, somewhat desperate looking. Queen e4, bishop b2, bishop takes d6 check. King f7. Bishop e5, rook takes d3, rook takes d3, resigns. And what I like about this line is that it's very simple. You, you just play knight c3 here, and you want to go knight d5. Now, black could also consider going knight f6, perhaps. Then white will still just play bishop e2. And black still has the same issue as before. This queen does not belong on e7. And I like this because it, it's easy to remember. All you need to do is get this far and say, well, next move, I'm going to go bishop e2. After that, I'm going to castle. And black will just be suffering. Uh, the If you've got a good memory, then you know, then sure, you can probably go for, for sharper lines. And I, I think to some extent, this is the problem that older players uh, have in uh, dealing with this modern computer-based preparation. They, they're they probably a little bit busy, you know, maybe with kids or grandkids, whatever. And, uh, you know, maybe their memories aren't quite as good. And they also come from an era where we used to work everything out. Right, we, we didn't rely on engines. We, we just had uh, the, the chessboard and a, a pile of informators. That was about as modern as it got. So, you know, if you're an older player, then this is the line for you. If you've got a good memory, then you might want to do something sharper. But black's position is, just looks miserable in either case. And I, I really don't understand why people are recommending this 1e5, you know, because it is, it, it is basically a pile. You know, there's no, there's no doubt about it. And in, in different ways. There's a few tricks, but it's just uh, it's not a good opening. I'm sorry. They need to go back to the drawing board. Um, yeah. OK, uh, I think I finished my little slot there slightly, slightly faster than expected. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to I'm going to hand over to to Andrew again. Let me let me just get his game up. <laughs> there we go. Even if you can't hear me, you should be able to to take a hint. OK. So this is well thank you uh, Nigel 
Um, I hope everybody enjoyed that little um, waltz through the England gambit. And um, what I think I like to do uh, occasionally is to prevent, uh, present a classic game to you, because I think uh, this can give us a, a lot of enjoyment. And um, I've chosen a game tonight between Karpov and Korchnoi. Uh, this comes from their famous match in Baguio City. And um, it's a very impressive game by Karpov in the Ray Lopez. Uh, to go through this game, I think, um, nice and slowly, with some analysis, would be a good thing for all of us. So Karpov was white, and Korchner responded to the Ray Lopez with the open variation. Um, that's knight takes e4. Of course, these days, we see a lot of um, deviations by Black before this point. Um, basically, Black's got a choice here, whether he goes in for the open variation or just plays more solidly with Bishop e7. That's the closed Ray Lopez. Um, of course, before this, back on move three, uh, White is having to deal a lot with the famous Berlin defence these days. And this is proving a really tough nut to crack. Rock solid. Perhaps not ideal for club players because the positions reached are actually quite dry. and uh, but, but suitable for somebody at a very high level who's trying to equalise with black. Now, of course, that approach is, is not really one which is um, very common among club players or uh, normal competitors. I mean, let's say the 99% of the chess population. They want something a bit more exciting. So I think the open variation is a really good line for, for kids to play or for club players to play because it furnishes black with active chances. And this is something you don't always get against the Ray Lopez. Ray Lopez is recognised as an opening of sustained pressure. That's what it's all about. And if you play into the closed Ray Lopez, well, if you're a grandmaster or a really strong player, of course you can do this. And, and it requires black to defend for a long while. But um, it's not everybody's cup of tea. There's also the martial gambit, which uh, is recognised as um, one of Black's best options. For instance, let's just see how that goes. Rookie one, uh, b5. That was the first point where White was actually threatening to win that pawn on e5 when Bishop takes knight. So Black blocks the threat. Back we go. And then Black castles. Well, I mean, if you've been looking at uh, the recent top tournaments, you'll see this position cropping up frequently. And the martial gambit occurs after c3, d5. The problem for black is that, for the most part, in top-class games these days, white simply doesn't allow it. And he plays other moves, mostly a4. There are other anti-martial moves. But uh, you won't see many really top-class players allowing the martial because it's thought to be so reliable. Um, and rather drawish. I know that sounds ridiculous, but... Uh, a lot of the games, when they're played at a very high level with a martial are drawn because the both, both players are just rattling out analysis. And it, it tends to crystallise to a situation where Black has got very active play, which negates White's extra pawn. I think there was a game in the Depomniachi versus Carlson match just like that. Maybe it was even the first game. Um, but at any rate, if you play the martial, you know, you're probably not going to get it. That is the problem. You learn all this analysis, reams of analysis, and then White just sidesteps it. So, for practical purposes, knight takes e4 is a pretty good move. Now, the problem with it, of course, is that um, although black gets active play, his pawn structure is a little bit loose. I mean, this is the only slight drawback with the open variation. And really good players, I'm talking about top-class players, can often take advantage of that slight issue with... Uh, with the black opening play. For instance, there's a weak square at C5. There might be a possibility of white putting something on D4. Um, if white can move his knight on F3 and play F4, F5, black can also get into trouble. We'll see some of these motifs in our, in our current game. But uh, again, at club level, at uh, lower levels than master, let's say, it's really difficult for white to get any advantage at all. And you very often see black getting a nice attack with the open Ray Lopez, uh, but not in this game. Now, White has got a number of moves here. Um, C3 was the main move for a long, long time. And the main idea of that was to stop Black going Knight C5 
when White could just retreat his bishop and keep the Spanish bishop. Then it was found that actually um, White didn't need to do that. And knight bd2 might be a slight improvement on that sequence. Allowing black to play knight c5 and then white just plays c3 anyway. And if black wants to take that bishop, well, of course he can. But then after knight takes b3, we see that, uh, that white has got solid control over the central dark squares. And um, it's not at all easy for black to equalize in a position like this, although he might be able to do it. Now, there have been some famous games with this variation. I mean, one of the most famous was Karpov v. Korchnoi again, where black played d4 in this position. And then black, uh, white came out with this uh, uh, astonishing sacrifice, knight g5, which was uh, an invention of Igor Zaitsev, I believe. Uh, there was some debate about uh, whether it was invented by Tal or not, but it was actually Zaitsev who, who invented this move. Anyway, because we haven't got all night, I don't propose to go for that variation uh, tonight. But uh, in this game, Korshnoi played an interesting move, g6. And although he actually got slaughtered in this game, this might not be so bad. And players like Yasha Mure and Korshnoi himself will go on to strengthen this variation, uh, as we'll see a bit later on. Anyway, uh, so G6, well, it looks log it looks logical. If it works, it's great. Black's going to train his sights on the pawn at E5. So Karpov played Queen E2, Black played Bishop G7. And there might even be a threat here of Knight D7 picking up that pawn. So, for instance, if White plays a move like Rook E1, let's just say, can Black play Knight D7 and come in and gobble that pawn? Looks very, very cheeky. But this is quite a cheeky variation, as we're going to see. So bishop g7 was played, and now Karpov played knight to d4. And this is the really first interesting position of the game. Uh, because white's offering the pawn on e5, which actually Korchnoi took. Now, he could probably get away with this move. But as we'll see, the defence is quite difficult. Murray made an attempt to strengthen this variation. And he's got a really original mind. I don't know if you know Yashir Mure. He should, he should seek out his games because they're quite extraordinary, full of inventive and interesting chess. He tried to strengthen this variation with a very weird knight takes knight, pawn takes knight, and now knight b7. Now, that looks utterly ridiculous at first sight. But the point is, of course, to play c5. So, for instance, if white tries to weaken black's pawns as they normally do um and then well he's got to move the knight to get any sort of play can black now go c5 anyway the engine showed this is equal and murray had success with this move so that's one one uh, way for for black to deviate from our game i mean let, let's just go back now to the the game itself and Korchnoi, because he had great faith in his defensive powers he took the pawn allowing Karpov to play f4. And now this is the second point where Korchnoi might have been able to improve. He played knight c4. But is knight d e d3 a move? This is another uh, suggestion that uh, has subsequently been found to be quite uh, interesting for black. Because if white goes f5, this is white's main idea to, to push through on the f-file. Black can actually take this bishop. And acquiring this bishop is quite a valuable uh, thing for black. Because we get a position here. And you'll, you'll see this is similar to the game. Except that white preserves his, his bishop. Which makes a heck of a difference. Um, and, and g8 is actually not a bad move here. Very strange looking position. It looks as though Black's position is about to crumble, but he could castle on the queen side. So this is another one of those positions, if we drop back, where Korchner could have played something else, but didn't. He played knight to c4. And um, Karpov now pushed on with the energetic f5. Incidentally, if you look through Karpov's games, you know, he's, now, he's known as a master strategist and a ruthless exploiter of any small 
advantage in the position. But in fact, he was a brilliant attacking player and um, seemed to save save his best up for Korchnoi. Played a number of brilliant attacking games against Korchnoi. I remember one in the Dragon, which was a, a fantastic, fantastic uh, experience. Well, anyway, F5. Um, I think Black's got to take that. In comes the Knight. And now this is another point where Black could have done something different. Now, he voluntarily gave up the Bishop. Could he have got on, got on away with Bishop F8? I mean, it looks hellishly risky because you're keeping your king in the middle, but you are preserving your Bishop. And what does White play? If he plays Knight D4... I think we can go queen d7. If he plays just dropping back, bishop c2, let's say. Then I think we can go knight d6. And oust the strongly placed knight on f5. So all these things, you know, make this variation quite intriguing. And... Um, most lot of people play knight bd2 these days, so you could shock them by by going in for this and trying to trying to seek out this uh, this new analysis. So rook g8 was played. Anyway, knight takes c4. Courtney took back bishop c2, and now black plunged his knight. Now I think this was the point of the whole defence to try and block uh, block the open lines by putting the knight in on d3. Bishop h6. Of course, the drawback with Black's position is that his king is stuck in the middle. And, um, well, Bishop f8 was played. Now, again, was that the best move? What happens after Bishop takes h6? This is quite interesting. Knight takes h6 and now Rook g6. It looks as though this is quite impossible, actually, because... Well, what happens after the knight takes f7? But then the extraordinary queen e7 comes. And suddenly it's not so easy for white. Very strange position. If white takes on d3, let's say, we take back. Well, maybe, maybe here actually queen e4 is starting to look dangerous. But even there, check. King h1, queen d5. What's going on here? So there are a number of intriguing points in this game at which uh, at which Korchnoi uh, could have improved, maybe. But bishop f8 just allows Karpov to show his attacking brilliance. Rook comes in pinning the knight. Queen d5, hoping to get some tricks in on g2, but no such luck because Karpov just... Takes twice on d3. Queen to c6. Bishop f8. King takes a queen b6 check first and intermezzo. King takes f8. And now queen to f3. And, well, black's problem, of course, is, is clear to see. His king is high and dry. Knight h6. Rook g7. Now the point of the whole, whole position, the beautiful rook d7. Uh, you don't get many games like this in a world championship match. I don't know whether this could be classed as a miniature. Um, not really a 28 move massacre in a way, but um, it's rare to see games of this type in a world championship match and even less so these days. So here, basically after Rook D7, um, Black is completely lost. He tried Rook B8 and then Knight takes F7. Bishop takes d7, knight d8, uh, concludes a beautiful game. So I hope you enjoyed that, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed the show. Such as it is, it will get better. I hope to hear the, the show next time, but I'm going to pass you back to Nigel now to uh, wrap uh, things up, maybe. Do, does, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Well, does, does anyone have any questions? Does 
I, I can I can see the stream. You've got to type them into the uh, the stream chat. Right, I've got a I, I've got a question uh, that I have to Facebook message to Andrew. Uh, Show anti martial Okay, let me uh, let me have a go with this. Right, your your basic anti martial ideas. Right, so the 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 martial is here with c3 d5, where you've got like various options about how to to try and handle this. You can go a4. Right, this was uh, uh, Nepanyachi against Carlson, I think. You you can also go a3. This was uh, Alexei Swayton's move. And it's a different way to preserve the bishop should black play knight a5. So after this, you probably just go, um, well, you go c3 probably. And you can retreat the bishop to a2 now. You have another anti martial a simple one in d3. So then when black goes d6, you go c3. And you have another one in h3. So now the, the idea is that when you haven't played c3, you've got the, the knight available to come to c3. So we have like this, takes, rook takes, c6 d3 and your knight can come to c3 so those, those are your ranges of anti martial the other the other anti martial is of course this move 1d4 that will help a lot against the marshal <laughs> won't help you against the englands but i think we we more or less covered that so uh yeah does that does that answer the question i'm just uh right Okay, I, I, I see a message in the chat. Best anti martial is the QGD exchange, which, uh, <laughs> yeah, play, playing 1d4. Then you've got other annoyances like the Slav, right? The, the, the Slav is also very annoying. And, uh, you know, some people play one knight f3. I tell you, an opening which I think is very underestimated is knight c3 and this is also an anti petrov because if they play knight f6 you can also play knight c3 here and then knight c6 leads to a four knights then you've got the gleck variation you have bishop b5 you have d4 and you even have oddball moves like a3 which uh is, is not as stupid as it looks. Bishop b4 is not a good move now, obviously. And even bishop c5 can be met by knight takes there, takes there, d4. And now the bishop can't go to there. When he comes back here, I would go f4. So then we can have a lot of fun with, with this kind of thing. Uh, will we keep the option, are we going to recover the piece or play... Bishop d3, or even f5. Yeah, they, they all look good. So that's that's the other anti martial option that I think is a pretty good one at club level. So uh, I hope that answers the question. I'm just checking back on the chat to see if we have any more questions here. Uh, no. <laughs> right, well... Uh, Okay, someone's saying, my brain hurts. I'll stick with the QGD exchange, thanks. Uh, is there a way to play the Tory attack without gamb gambiting the B2 pawn? I'll, I'll show this. This will be our, our last act of the day. Tory attack without gambiting the B2 pawn is like this. Knight F3, E6, C3. And then when they go C5, you go Bishop G5. Or you go Bishop G5 here. C5, C3, Queen B6, 
you can now play queen b3. So it's with c3 instead of e3. I mean, you can also play uh, like bishop g5, c5, e3, queen b6, queen c1, which is okay. So, uh, yeah. Okay, well, I think, I think the time has come for myself and Andrew to sign off. Uh, hang on, I just put a, a message in the, the chat. Thanks for coming. Next show on Monday. <laughs> Why, uh, recordings will, should be available. Okay, thank you and good night.